This Our Ohio special presentation is made possible thanks to the generous support from Anthem Blue Cross and Blue Shield and by Ohio Farm Bureau members. For nearly 100 years, Ohio Farm Bureau has been bringing people together. Join us in the journey. Together. Together. Together with farmers. And by. At DPNL, our job is to serve the Miami Valley. You can count on us to continue to provide your family with power so your lives can stay up and running. We're Dayton Power and Light. And by. Located in Indian Hill, Turner Farm focuses on healthy organic foods, sustainable farming methods, and community supported agriculture. Turner Farm, teaching, learning, and growing. And by your membership support to this public television station. Thank you. Addiction. You can't outrun the stigma, but you can fight it head on. The road to recovery begins with 20 seconds of courage. It's the hell of all hells. For approximately 20 years, I've lived through the disease of addiction through multiple kids. If my phone would ring, I would literally jump because I figured it was one of, one of my kids. The path that addicts go down, if you love them, you just come along behind them picking up the pieces. Heather was just a, a warm person to be around. She was a charismatic, beautiful young girl with dimples and a smile on her face all the time, but she had drug issues. She got sent away for eight months, and that was the beginning of her sobriety. And she was clean for over three years. And the next time I saw her, she was working at a local restaurant, had a smile on her face. We hugged. She was doing really well, telling me about the garden that she was growing. And she, you know, uh, relapsed. Three months later, I heard she overdosed and died. She overdosed in my house the night before Easter, the heroin. Roger also had two sons, Gene and Roger T. Me and my brother were best friends best friends, um, did a lot together. Uh, we had each other's back. And one of the last things we had, well, tried to have is we stood in front of my sister's casket and said, you know, we need to do this for our parents, which that's pretty heavy, you know what I mean? Because we all know what happened with that, so. The call came in at 7.35 p.m. on December 20th overdose. Chief Molden was familiar with the address. They'd been there before. You hope it's early enough that there's a chance to make a difference. A couple of times it was, but the, the last time it wasn't. So then my thoughts go into, what can I do for my friend? So, you know, I drive to the hospital and was there for Roger. And then I come back to the station. Emotionally, that was very difficult for me. The people in the fire department knowing Roger and his family so well. A lot of hurt. So, in 2016, uh, I lost my daughter. Then I lost my son five days before Christmas of the same year. We hear numbers, and we forget. We forget that every number is a mother, a father, or someone's child. Wayne Township has a population of 4,880. In 2016, we had 13 overdoses. In those 13 overdoses, we had four deaths. 
In 2017, we had 19 overdoses. We had two deaths. When you get even 19 overdoses, that's pretty substantial. The opioid crisis is taking lives and destroying families, like the fabric of a weather-beaten flag. The threads that hold communities together are snapping. Small towns in rural Ohio are at risk of coming undone. But here, a diverse group of people have stood up and said, enough. A few years ago, I was seeing a large number of folks that we had placed on standard traditional probation not completing probation because they were dead. I have been a judge now 32 plus years, and I grew up in a philosophy of just say no, why can't people who are on drugs just stop? Say yes to your life, and when it comes to drugs and alcohol, just say no. As I learned more about what opiates do to the brain and how we have, as a society, been treating the drug epidemic differently than we should. We treat it as a criminal matter, and I think the brain science is finally catching up to where we are agreeing it is a health issue, it is a disease, and it is not a moral failure. Because that's what life's about. In response to the crisis, Judge Ruddock developed a drug court. Some folks don't yet. Drug court is a highly structured therapeutic program that runs for a minimum of 18 months. I know how hard you're trying. I know how far you've come. And then I came in that next week, and Kashira came out and said, Brent overdosed. He's in the hospital. They had to revive him with six doses of Narcan. You're a part of this group. And so, so I want them to learn what you did wrong. Have you thought about it? I mean, yeah, I've thought about it. I had a little bit over 90 days sobriety in. I just let little things in life get to me, and I would, instead of reaching out and talking to anybody, I went out and used it. Luckily, I was on some kind of routine. I mean, I was working. I was picking my kids up every evening from the babysitter at 6 o'clock. And like 6.30, I wasn't there. So the babysitter called my old lady, and, and they started calling my phone. And <clears throat> I wasn't answering my phone. And they said I'd been laying in there an hour and a half, two hours. You've got to have a plan of attack for these contingencies. You've got to be prepared. How am I going to react to that? Call me. Call Shkashira. Call a support group. Call your supervision officer. We do not want you to fail. We don't want you to die. Yes, sir. I'm glad you're here. You got knocked down. We're going to move on, and it's going to work. The judge is the head of a recovery team that includes social workers, physicians, counselors, and supervision officers. You're doing well. You're working hard. You got a good job. Kishari, you want to give me an update? He is doing really well. I know what's going on. He's stopped in a few times. We've had some conversations. so. Um, he's trying really hard right now. Yeah, I had all kinds of good news. Um, my son turned 18 today. Um, I got a raise at work. Um, I got my year coin back on Valentine's Day. You got your year and, coin? Yeah, last year when my little thing happened, uh, that sounds familiar. Um, Tell Brent. No, I was in the same, same situation you're in right now. And um, I just put it behind me and let it go. And I did the exact same thing you did too. I, had every resource I could possibly have, and I just froze up one day. Well, I'm happy for you, and uh, I know you're reunited with your family, and uh, a whole lot of positive things on it. But you know, in the back of my mind. The structural foundations that we relied upon so much, schools, the churches, the family, and the government actually, have all deteriorated and this is bigger than a judge can solve. This is bigger than the criminal justice system. 2017, one Sunday in June at the Blanchester Church of the Nazarene, a distraught mother asked for prayers for her drug-addicted daughter. It was heartbreaking to see a mother in tears, just crying out for help and that just kind of prompted the creation of Hope Warriors. My name is Sarah. My son Alex is a recovering addict. He's been clean this go round since September 8th. Oh, yeah. I started coming here for the support. 
there was no one to talk to. And this quickly became my family. Mm -hmm. So that's why I'm here. Hope Warriors is a support group that is geared toward helping families of addicts to educate them and support them with love and connectedness. Two years ago, I went out looking for help after losing two kids to overdoses. I ended up here. They've been a lot of support to me. I'm grateful and thankful that my remaining child is 14, 15 months clean and going strong. I just pray that it stays that way. Shortly after starting going there, my remaining child had was uh, gotten out of county and he started going there with me. Hope Warriors means a lot to me. Like, until we met Lisa and you, we, it was just us. And you have to have that first. It was time. us, and we're both addicts. So, I mean, one fuels the other. So you one can't would really try to get clean, system. the other one would, would not. You know what I'm saying? It's one of them things during the week that if you don't do, you feel like you're missing, you miss something. Might I say something for Lisa, that this woman's an absolute angel and has yet to turn her back on us, even after the relapse. And, once a person goes from judging someone to feeling the love for that person, it's like a weight lifted off of your shoulders. For Lisa, it wasn't always that way. She has a grandson, and the boy's mother was on heroin. I was very frustrated, angry didn't understand, you know, how she could leave a child in mine and my husband's care and not want to see him for weeks or months at a time. It's your turn. Aw, I got negative 50. It's devastating for the whole family to have to go through not understanding, not knowing how to help. Oh, no. Buried under the headlines, is that desperate sense of helplessness that afflicts the families of addicts. You've got kids, and I know how much you love them. How would you feel that when your kids got on a horse, and that horse just took off running out across the field, out of control, the child can't control the horse, and there's not a damn thing you can do. All, only thing you can do is stand there and watch this horse run away with your child on it, not knowing where it's gonna end up. How would that make you feel? I believe you do know what it is. With her grandson's future in the balance, it was no time for half measures. When she started relapsing, I didn't really trust her to be around her son. And that's hard. When you gotta look at a mom and say, you can't be around your child right now because I don't trust you to be around your child. That's a hard thing. It would have been easy for Lisa to give up on her. She didn't. Walking the journey with her really helped me to understand. Not every recovering addict is so fortunate. It's a tough road to walk alone. The girl that I had here a few months ago said that she was trying to stay clean. She had spent five months in jail, uh, asked for help, begged for help when she got out. She couldn't get anybody to help her. See, that's the problem. Her family wrote her off and she sat on the floor back there and she looked at me and said it would be so much easier mm -hmm. to go back to the drug because at least the drug people had me yeah. that's and that's that's, that's their the family truth. okay you've got a place to stay and you got someone who you think cares about you you know right. what I mean? and you're using right. so you know what i mean like those are the people are the hardest ones to help those are the ones that people wash their hands with because they don't families of addicts struggle to understand why but learning firsthand about the power of opioid addiction is a painful education. Where did you go? I don't care how great your life is, how many kids you have, how beautiful they are, your spouse, your family, how loving they are. The opioids attach their receptors to your brain, and then it, it basically, at that point in time, it ends your life, and you live from the drug.
when you're not high, you're in misery. You know, um, in the back of your mind, you know you're destroying your life, your mind, your body, your relationships. And the bad thing is, is once you got high, you know what your next thought is? Is not, do I have children to take care of? Not, do I need to work? It's, how am I going to get high tomorrow? For many years, I was one of those people that didn't understand addiction, not even realizing that you know, my own addiction from smoking, the habits kind of are similar, one more powerful than the other, but addiction is addiction. 20 years of drug addiction leaves a long trail of broken promises and emotional wreckage. Looking back with clear eyes can be a powerful revelation. This was my home for 20 years, my entire adult life, um, basically the, through my entire addiction, this is where I live. It's a good reminder of where I've came from because you know, this is what my addiction allowed me to think was normal. I can think back just being in here, the, the thought of helplessness and hopelessness and uh, no end in sight, no way out. It's pretty powerful, for real. When Roger T. was ready to get clean, it was obvious he needed to get out. I'm trying to find my way home. My father knew that. I knew that. I moved in with him, which means everything to me. Because um, if it wasn't for that, I probably wouldn't be sitting here. Um, drove me to and from probation and counseling. Uh, twice a week uh, at that time. And uh, it was rough, I mean, it was it was rough at first, just um, because when you become sober, you um, come back to reality, to what you've done. I'm very grateful for where we're at today. He's done a hell of a job doing his part of staying away from those people, places and things. I didn't do it for him. I just provided the environment to give him his best chance to do what he needed to do. Roger T's drug use started early. He abused alcohol and smoked weed in high school. But it was after a work injury that he became acquainted with opioids. 70 to 80% of the folks who end up addicted to heroin actually got started with pain pills. Back in 1996 when Oxycontin was approved by the Federal Drug Administration, as a non-addictive opioid. Purdue Pharma sold that bill of goods to the FDA, but obviously we found out they were wrong, the FDA was wrong, and the result was that people were selling their pain pills on the streets for as much as a dollar a milligram, and the doctors were prescribing it like crazy. That has changed. Dr. Catherine LaRuffa is a family physician in Blanchester, Ohio. Her father was a doctor in Blanchester for 50 years. We screen patients before we write our first prescription. We check them with an opioid risk assessment tool. Then we tell the patient they must sign a drug contract. One doctor, one pharmacy. And essentially, we will be making sure that you are filling your medications appropriately. So and we will do urine drug screens. Many years ago, we weren't in the business of being police, but now we have to literally conduct ourselves as though our patients may be violating a contract and the law. And we have had to fire several patients over the years. Recovery starts with a safe place to live. In sparsely populated rural areas, that problem is magnified. One of the major things that we've been missing are re it was recovery housing. If I've got a 19 or a 20 year old woman who dropped out of school and maybe has two kids, uh, where am I gonna send them, okay? Back to the significant other who's probably drug addicted or back to the broken home uh, where maybe people are using drugs. Not everybody's in that category, but there's a significant amount of the population that falls into that category. So what we've developed here with, with state funding are three sober living houses. The goal is for our women to 
integrate recovery into their lifestyle. So we connect them with resources in the community, meetings. Um, there's usually some kind of outpatient treatment that goes along with living here. This is Linda Tucker. I'm calling on behalf of Clean Acres Women's Recovery House. I was calling to schedule... Um, we connect them with any other resources that they may need. Assisting them getting their driver's license back, um, you know, straightening out any court requirements that they have. To see these women come in so broken and to go out so beautifully um, rebuilt, it's just a miracle. In the world of addiction, the past is always present. Some things are never forgotten. And everything that I've went through for the last 20 years still affects me to this day. Oh, it will. There's things that he does innocently, not intentionally, but innocently. Usually I can stand at the bottom of the steps and holler his name and he'll hear me. There's been multiple times where I've done that and I don't get no answer. Do you know how long of a walk that is up them steps? Oh, yeah, because you're the Do you the know fear. how hard it is to knock on that door, afraid of what I'm going to see because of what I experienced with my daughter? That's going to stick with me the rest of my life. Oh, well, I just... You understand my father, you know what I mean? He's still skeptical, but which he should be, but there's nothing that I'm scared of or, or as far as recovery goes that I'm going to have a lifetime of, 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 of a good fear. Of, of relapse, I, I, you have to keep that as an addict because um, it's reality. I'm very grateful that I still have him, but it scares the dickens out of me. And he just passed the one year mark. That's a big benchmark, but I don't know that I'll fully relax until he gets up about three, three and a half years. It's not nothing against my son. It's just the reality of the addiction. I've come a long ways. In the last year, I tell people that, I'm, that I too am in, in recovery. I've made massive improvements since last year, but I've still got a long ways to go. I'm a changed man inside. As we mount a response to this healthcare crisis, one issue threatens to derail our best efforts, overcoming the stigma of drug addiction. A stigma that is especially strong in conservative rural communities. When families have problems, what do we want to do? We don't want to advertise it. We want to kind of internalize it or hide it inside of our family. For me, it took a lot of courage. I'm not ashamed at all anymore. I used to be, but it just takes 20 seconds of courage to say, okay, I need to talk about this because you never know when your story is gonna enable someone else to talk about their story. There's families every day losing loved ones to addiction. And you know someone that's struggling with addiction, instead of judging them, reach out and love them. I think they're understanding that we really care. And you can't fake that. You got some stuff going on. Yes, sir. Okay. Don't do something screwy. Okay. All right. Call me. You got my number. Dude. No, okay. Give me my number. You got my number. I don't want to Some of you got my number because I get calls. I don't, you know, I don't want all of you calling me, you know, whenever you get a stressor or something. That's why. But judges can sit up there and talk. It's not as powerful as somebody who's been directly affected by it. And Roger, with the loss of two children, has been directly affected by it. So he's going to be doing our closing on March 2nd. Pastor Paul Castile of the Blanchester Church of Christ ministered to Roger and his son in their time of greatest need. On Hope Sunday, he asked father and son to share their faith with the congregation. Part of the healing, I think, is taking that pain and doing something constructive with it. And Roger's definitely doing that. I have a different outlook on life now. Uh, the loss of my kids has changed me forever. Join together love one another, help erase the stigma. He just takes the bull by the horns, which is a great thing. Before we get started, I want to tell you that for our closing today, you are going to meet Roger Weinmiller. Roger is a farmer near Blanchester, and he's lost two children to drugs. So what he's doing as a result of that tragedy 
is trying to help others. And that's what this whole thing is about. To help you understand that you are not alone and there are a lot of people who care about you. I'm the one that found him. I'll never forget that night the rest of my life. I made a promise to God, my daughter, myself, that some way, somehow, I would try to make a difference. We're fighting for more resources, more treatment centers, better understanding. We have a support group out in Blanchester. We'll give you love and support to help you along your journey. I love you guys so much, and I don't even know you. It's just I know the fight that you're going through. Use us to bring those that are walking in death into life, whether it's a family member or whether it's an addict, Lord. Maybe in the beginning they made a poor choice, but once they become addicted, I don't look at it as a choice anymore. We become very invested in these people. Um, these are not case numbers. And the reality is, they're a person just like you and me. We thank you for being with Maria in her darkest moment. It's a huge celebration when someone goes into recovery. I just, I want to become the man I was meant to be. We can turn this thing around because recovery is possible. Lord, we pray for Roger and we pray for his family because he's tired and it's just hard. He needs help and he needs us to help carry him and lift him. I made a promise to make a difference. This Our Ohio special presentation is made possible thanks to the generous support from Anthem Blue Cross and Blue Shield and by Ohio Farm Bureau members. For nearly 100 years, Ohio Farm Bureau has been bringing people together. Join us in the journey. Together. Together. Together with farmers. And by. The Miami Valley is one of a kind and the families that live here deserve the very best. DPNL is committed to keeping your power on so your lives can stay running and your family is happy. We're Dayton Power and Light. And by, located in Indian Hill, Turner Farm focuses on healthy organic foods, sustainable farming methods, and community supported agriculture. Turner Farm, teaching, learning, and growing and by your membership support to this public television station. Thank you.